Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 318. Whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability and remember that every second that disappears will never come back. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Do you know the best way to protect your vehicle, both the exterior and interior, is with a car cover? I've been using Covercraft car covers since 1975. It's a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to keep your vehicle looking new. 2015 marks Covercraft's 50th anniversary. They've manufactured premium quality exterior and interior covers here in the United States with a reputation for durability and design. They're the world's largest manufacturer of custom patterned vehicle covers that are crafted to fit with over 80,000 patterns and growing. You can choose from dozens of fabric options and accessories, all designed and carefully sewn for your special vehicle. Made in the USA, Covercraft is the right choice. I've protected my special rides with their covers for over 40 years, and you should too. Learn more today at Covercraft.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I am revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest, John Vessels. John, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I sure am. I've got my harness on and ready to go. Thank you, Mark. All right. Well, I hope you won't need that harness. I'll try to keep the car off the walls as we go through our journey here today. Good. John Vessels lives in South Africa and has been building model cars for decades. In 2004, it was his automotive passion that led him to start designing and creating automotive sculptures. He founded Auto Couture after showing his Retro Deco designs at Techno Classics Essen in 2005. John established relations with two contacts, one in Holland and the other in England, where his metal and painted metal sculptures are represented and sold to discerning collectors from around the world. John, I've told our listeners just a little tiny bit about you. Would you take a moment and share a little more about your career and your passion for automobiles? Sure, Mark. Thank you so much. I, in fact, uh, much like you and many automotive enthusiasts, I guess I started off uh, by making plastic models, and I've been blessed with great hands. I'm able to do anything and, and think about anything. I'm, I'm never happier than when I'm tinkering with something or making something or trying to think outside of the dots to come up with a solution to a problem. And then I realized that, that building models was not a... The problem was that building models is great fun while you're doing it, but when they're finished, what do you do with them? You stick them on the shelf and they gather dust or break. Yes. So I would make Perspex covers for them. So I had hundreds of models with Perspex covers and of all shapes and scales from one twelfth down to oh one eighth down to one forty third. And so I approached Motor Books one day and asked them what I could do with these things. And they said, Ah, oh, Bring them up to the store. We'll have a look-see and see if we can sell them. Well, they really all sold real quick. And in fact, as a result of that, some of their customers started asking me for commissions to build a particular car. I, I built a, a 1.8 scale uh, 4.5 liter supercharged Bentley for a guy and laced all the spokes and did the little metal grills in front of the, wow. the headlights wow. and leather strap over the bonnet and all that. Sorry, over the hood. And uh, <laughs> the, the problem with that sort of thing is they're all once-offs and you can't replicate it. You, each one has got to be done individually. And also the Chinese started producing the most extraordinary, exquisite model motor cars in the finest details. And it was just almost impossible to replicate that. So I thought the best thing to do is to make it into an art form rather than a scale model. So I, I established my little logo, Haute Couture, which is a sort of take on Haute Couture. Yes. And I decided to stylize them and, and make them a little bit sort of, um, uh, how would you say? They're big in the front and tapered to the back and no rear wheels. So they're very um, stylized, as it were. Yes. And I just tried to capture the essence of the, the flowing beauty of, of particularly the, the 1952 R-type Bentley Continental, which to my mind is one of the most beautiful cars 
ever to touch the tarmac. Hmm. So hmm. I did that, and I went to Techno Classica Essen, that huge auto show in in Germany in 2005. I took, I think I took four or five Bentleys and a couple of Peugeots, which was all I had at the time. I did a 1938 Peugeot because I just loved this, the, the the headlights within the grill and that sort of swooping swage line, which went from under the grill all the way back to the tail. It was just such a pretty car. Mm-hmm. And so I sold all of them while I was in Germany and as a result got these two guys who bought from me and then asked if they could represent me. So it's been great and very rewarding. And I've met the most extraordinary people, guys who live in, in uh, Switzerland who have said to me, gee, I've got a home in South Africa and I spend five months of the year there and I keep an eight-liter Bentley, 1928 eight-liter Bentley in a garage there. So mm. come and visit me. And I did. And, and so I've met him. I've, I've met interesting people. I, I have to tell you that Eric Clapton, the guitarist, has two of my Bentleys in his office. Wow. So it's, it's really been fun. Well, I love your story in so many ways because it is really fitting as a guest here in Cars, yeah, that you figured out how to wrap that passion for cars into a vocation because I have the pleasure of knowing a little bit more about John than maybe some of you do. John, you're 71 years old, right? That's right. I'll be 72 in a few days' time. 11th of July, I'll be 72. Awesome. Well, a happy birthday, and for those listening, belated birthday to you. But what is really cool about your story So many of my guests started their passion for cars building models, and little did you know where it would take you into this form of your own stylized version of art. And I'll tell you, our guests will get links to your website. They'll be able to go and see what you create. But the creations that John has done, the stylizing he's done of these cars are just absolutely beautiful. They're works of art. They're sculptures. They're much, much more than models in my mind. So it's really great to have you here. As we continue on your journey, I always like to start by asking my guest for a success quote. It's some kind of saying that's been instrumental in forming your life, and it's a really great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars, yeah? So, John, take the wheel. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that that there is no doubt that life is always under construction, and the road to success is always under construction. Nothing is ever finite. You never reach the goal. In fact, if you reach the goal, you have to start another. I had a friend who built an L29 Cord uh, in this country, and when he'd finished it, he got into a huge depression because he thought, now what? Mm. I've done it. So he then uh, went and rebuilt a beach staggering, a B-17 staggering, which was fantastic. Wow. So, and the, The second thing I wanted to say, and that is something which I've learned having gained many scars in my eyes to replace the stars that one has when one is young, Mm -hmm. is one has to maximize one's UTR. And UTR is useful time remaining. So one has to really take every – you have to take life by the scruff of the neck and wring every bit of juice out of every second that you've got available to you because, man, they disappear so quickly and they don't come back. Well – Gosh, two awesome, wonderful success quotes, lessons, especially for those younger listeners out there. Gosh, yes, keep striving, keep moving forward, keep doing new things, interesting things to keep life going because life is so fragile. I have a good friend. I just talked to him this morning, a fellow car fanatic, Bill. He's a neurosurgeon. And he sees it every day, people that woke up that morning thinking, I've got a whole life ahead of me, and then they found out they've got some serious medical condition or they get in an accident, and it all comes to a crashing end. So uh, yes. very good way to go through life, my friend. Thank you. Very important. Would you share with me a story that instigated your passion for cars? I'd love to learn about that pivotal moment as you remember it in your life when you really knew you were a car guy. Ah, um, I, I, I always seem to have been a car guy. I was very lucky in that uh, South Africa, we were deprived during the, the 50s. It was fairly austere times after the Second World War, and there were no dinky toys in this country. And dinky toys were those beautiful little cast metal little cars. They're, I guess, around about 43rd scale, roughly. Oh, about. yeah, I had some dinky toys. <laughs> okay, and they're, they're major collectors of dinky toys in the world. Anyway, I was very fortunate in that I had an aunt who lived in Rhodesia, 
now Zimbabwe, and they had dinky toys, and she used to send them down to me, and I'll never forget going with my mother to the post office and collecting the parcel of dinky toys. Man, it was it was awesome. I just I was so privileged because none of my friends had these things, and I received a whole bunch of them, so it was great. Oh, wow, it's wonderful. You know, when I was a little kid, one of the cars, my first little car was a Matchbox by Lesney. And oh, yeah. the precursor to Hot Wheels, of course. And my father bought me, and our listeners have heard this ad nauseum. My first one was a red Jaguar XKE. And I still oh, have wow. that to this day. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun how those little toys and the Shuko wind-up toys that my Aunt Jenny yeah. had that she would let me play with when I'd go to her house. John, oh, wow. I'd love to take a look at some of the roads you've driven down and talk about challenges or even failures that you've faced throughout your career. But if you can take us down the road to one that really has meaning to you, but the most important part of this isn't so much of the challenge and the failure, but it's how you overcame that situation. And what did you learn from it? Mark, that is an interesting question. I I was looking at that little statement and I thought, I, I really never had any huge challenges or massive failures that I've sort of uh, thought about really Seriously, other than the fact that because I was so passionate and wanted to get into car design or start in industrial design and major in car design, and the only place where one could do that would be the art center in LA, it was a real disappointment that I was not able to do it either financially or physically because of the distance. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, there was a was an upside to that in that at that time I met my future wife. So. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of compensated for that one. Well, and you've been married now, you told me in our pre-show chat, is it 49 years? Yeah, it'll be 50 years in April next year. Wow. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you so much. There's something very special about a long-term relationship that you can't explain to anyone. You know, 33 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Art Center, I've had many guests here from Art Center, but let me ask you this, you know, since you've been fortunate and you haven't faced huge challenges, but if you'd gone to Art Center, what do you think the path would have been for you? I think because I can never leave anything alone standard, I would have wound up like a chip fruise or something, or uh, somebody who would have looked at a, a, a car and said, wow, that would have been a lot better with this motor in it, or maybe that rear end, or, uh, you know, just hot rodding. I think hot rodding would have been my thing. Yeah. Really would have. Well, you know what? As I talk to you here today, you have achieved that because you are building your own cars today. They're just yeah. a little smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. they are. Yeah, you've reached that goal. That's very cool. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. shift gears here and go to the other end of the spectrum. I'd love for you to share one of those career, what I like to call aha moments in your career when the headlights come on and illuminate your way for a new idea or a new direction you had. And tell us the steps you took to turn that aha moment into a success. Okay. I think it was the realization that the the mass-produced model motor cars, which were being made by Exoto and Auto Art and all of these CMC and the others, were just becoming so spectacular that it, there was no point in making a model anymore. The only reason why I used to make models is because I could make them really well and they would be better than anybody else's. And and uh, the plastic kits, which I based it, most of them on, were really good to, to start off with. So if good painting and good detailing, you could make a fantastic model. And then I realized that it was, they, were, they were just, they were each an individual one. You had to start from scratch for each one. So I thought, let me create a master of, of a piece of art, create a, an art piece of an automotive shape, which I particularly liked, and then make a master and cast it. And, and so I made a silicon mold, and cast it, and now I can replicate them. And then each one is different because they're handmade. I've just shipped one off to the, the UK now, which is actually quite exciting because they asked me for a particular, they gave me a, the chassis number of this particular Continental, uh, R-Type Continental, and said it's green. And they sent me a photograph. And having had experience with getting the paint color wrong from a photograph, I said, no, 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 photograph's no good. I need, what is the specification of this paint? And so through some research on the internet, I discovered this particular car had been rebuilt in 2002, and it was painted in a color called smoke green. 
Mm. So I went to my automotive supplier, paint supplier, and I said, do you have Bentley Smoke Green? Can you mix me up a liter? And they did. So I, in fact, shipped it off today to the UK. So that's hopefully in the next five days we'll get to a, a, another guy who bought the real one, and he's now going to have a smoke green one on his desk to to replicate his real one. And it's got the chassis number at the bottom of it as well. So. Oh, very cool. Well, you know, you're right. When AutoArt came on the scene, CMC, I've got models from both of those companies and some of the other ones. The detail and the perfection that these companies can put into their cars is absolutely mind-boggling. And oh, yes. I love the fact that it pushed you to take a turn in your road and go down this path you've gone down. Because what you're creating, I think, is so much more special than just replicating a vehicle over and over and over again. Uh, you're you're really producing works of uh, sculptural art that are so special. And uh, boy, you. yeah, just absolutely wonderful. How about proudest career moments? Is I would assume you've had many, but is there one in particular you could share with us today? Um, yeah, I I think I find it quite extraordinary that little old me and way down the southern tip of Africa has become known to many people in Europe and a few in the U.S. as well who who love my art pieces and tell me so, and they've enriched my life enormously and there's nothing more satisfying than to get a, a thank you note from somebody in Switzerland who bought a real Bentley and was given a one of my sculptures as a sort of companion to the real one and then he writes me and tells me how nice it is and thank you for beautifying the automotive world and mm. can we meet mm. sometime it was just it's just it's it's really rewarding. It really is. Yes, you know, you've said some things here that I hear over and over and I know this myself this car hobby we're in, the passion around automobiles, is really about the people and not the cars. And the, the people we get to meet, the, the, fan, the chance that I'm sitting here talking to you today, you're in South Africa, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. We've just become car buddies, if you will. Yeah. And it's the automobile that's brought us together. That's really what's done it. Absolutely right. And I, I really appreciated people like Jay Leno when he's with his car garage. He's a real car guy. And, and he says, so rightly, he says, I don't own these cars. I'm just the custodian of them to look after them for the next generation. Yes, absolutely. Jay's another guy I would love to get on this show. Jay, if you're listening, give me a call, buddy. I need to talk to you. Absolutely. Let's have a little bit of fun here. What was your first really special car? And if you could share a memory that you have with that vehicle. Okay. When I turned 21, I was given some money by various people and I scraped together enough uh, to buy a car, and I looked around, and I made a list of cars I wanted, and at that time, now we're talking 1964, I thought I would like a Porsche, a Porsche 356. So, only having enough money for a used one, what my wife and I, or my future wife at that time, and I did was we cruised around all the shopping malls and in the shopping parking lots. <laughs> looking for a Porsche and we found one and there was a woman sitting in it and it was a red one and I walked up to her and I said uh, we're really interested in, in buying a Porsche is this one for sale she said as a matter of fact it is my wife, husband has just bought a 1964 356C so this 356B is on the market so I scraped all my cash together and put it in a suitcase and we went over to his home <laughs> and I Gave him the suitcase and took the car. <laughs> wow, very cool, very cool. Well, uh, you know, I love Porsches. They're one of my favorite marks, and I love the old 356s. I've never had one, but I've always wanted to own one. Share with us a story that you have, a memory you have with that car. Okay, <clears throat> well, first of all, it was like driving. It, it, the Porsche, is. it feels as though it's carved out of one piece. It doesn't feel as though it's a sort of conglomeration of many pieces. It is so solid. You, you couldn't close the door without cracking the window a little bit. It would hurt your ears. It was so airtight. And um, I remember my wife and I driving down from Johannesburg to Natal, which is about 400 miles in the dead of winter. And the heater in that car was a sort of collector around the exhaust manifolds. <laughs> yes. It blew, 
blew hot air on your feet. Mm-hmm. But you couldn't you couldn't have the windows closed. You had to have the windows open because otherwise you'd you'd suffocate. Not not from exhaust gas, but from the sheer heat of this thing. So we drove with toasty feet and freezing head, and all through the snow that was in the in the mountains past uh, between Johannesburg and Durban. <laughs> it was it was great. You know, I have a I'm a smile on my face right now because when I was in high school, I had a Carmen Ghia that had the same kind oh. of heating system, oh. and I used to drive it up from Southern California <laughs> to Mammoth Mountain and have the same issues. You'd have really toasty <laughs> toes, but the top of your head yeah. would be frozen. <laughs> yeah. See, that's a pretty car, that common gear. Mm. Yes, I'd love to have another one someday. Uh, I think they're just beautiful little cars. Of course, I would another, want a, I'd want a 2.2 liter uh, Porsche 911 engine in the back. Yeah, well, I tell you, the guy from whom I bought my 356B had done just that. He had a common gear with a Porsche motor in it. Oh, wow. Okay, well, there's hope for me then. I think there's enough yep. room in the back of those cars. There's a lot of space back there. So, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that would be fun. Oh, yeah. How about seller's remorse? Is there a vehicle that you've let go in your past that you really wish you could have back in the garage? Uh, yeah, I guess my little old MGTF was quite fun. Although, you know, a lot of cars, Mark, these days, the older cars were very pretty, but they're really coffee table cars. They're not fun to drive these days in, in modern traffic conditions. They're clunky and jiggly and noisy and bouncy and no air con and no central locking and no, I think I, I think the Porsche is probably the, the one I'd, I'd really love to have been able to keep. Yes, they're wonderful. When I was a little boy, my father bought an MGTC, so a little older than your TF, a mm-hmm. little less sophisticated, and uh, I always had kind of dreamt of maybe I could have one of those someday, and I got to do mm-hmm. a photo shoot one day and shoot one of those cars, and the owner was nice enough to let me drive it, and I think after taking it three blocks, I went, I think that fantasy's over with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, beautiful oh. to look at, but a little tough to drive, and you not want to get on a freeway on one of those things. No, and they were slower than the second coming as well. They're a little slow. Hard to believe that guys actually raced those cars back in the day, but, uh, you know, different times. How about current projects? Is there something you're working on today that really has you excited and fired up? Yeah, my um, Netherlands or, or Dutch agent has inquiry from a guy who desperately wants an e-type mm. so i'm in the middle of carving an e-type at the moment I, I can i can send you a couple of photographs mark i'll do that i would love to see that you know the e-type like i mentioned is the car that started it all for me it is such a beautiful design and i was thinking and as i was looking at your work an e-type would be wonderful for you to do well what i've done i've taken i have a drawing which i've pumped up to about one eighteenth scale or one sixteenth scale uh-huh just a pen and ink drawing, and I've I carved the original one from that, but I've I've shortened the the cockpit and made it smaller and tightened the tail up, and you know I've just kind of tweaked it in my my style. So I'll send you a couple of pictures of that. Oh, I oh, can't wait to see it. It's going to be a beautiful piece. Now here's a very introspective question for you, John. I love to ask this question of all my guests, and especially for creative, artistic guests like you. If you were a car. What kind of car would you be and why? I think this might be a real curveball, but I think a Citroen DS21. Okay. Well, you know, I recently had a guest on this show who mentioned a Citroen as well, and I, I find that answer very intriguing. So why that car? Well, I don't know if, you know, you wouldn't recall it because you're a lot younger than I, but I'll never forget in 1956 when the Paris Auto Show was bombed by that Citroen DS19 or ID19. It was unbelievable. The, the, it was spectacular. Mm. And I'll, I'll never forget that image of that thing because I, I, I had Motor Magazine and Auto Car and they were raving about it and it had this pneumatic suspension and it was, and, but the design was spectacular and it's still the same. It, it, it remained the same other than the sort of slight change in headlights, etc. For all the years of its production, it was just an extraordinary motor car. The only thing I don't like about it is the clunky four-cylinder engine. I, had I been younger and a little money, I would have taken one of those and put a little, I don't know, maybe a, a V6 into it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, of course, Citroen came along and put that Maserati engine in uh, yep. one of their vehicles. But I've had a guest on this show, one of my very early guests, a friend of mine, Kenji Yoshino. He lives in the Northwest and sells Citroen parts. and 
he introduced yeah. me to Citron. I'd never ridden in one. And uh, once I got in the car and he started showing me all the innovative design elements of that vehicle, my whole appreciation for the car changed. Isn't it extraordinary? It really it's is. Really yeah. is. Well, great choice. I think that fits you perfectly. I love that. So, John, <laughs> up next is the last lap. But before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars yeah sponsor. Have you turned your key and heard that dreaded tick, 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 tick because of a dead battery? No worries. I've got the NOCO Genius Boost Jump Starter. This compact tool fits in your glove box and features rechargeable lithium battery technology that will start a dead battery in your car, boat, truck, or RV. It packs a whopping 12-volt, 400-amp starting power and can start up to 20 dead batteries on a single charge. Plus, it has built-in spark-proof technology with reverse polarity protection to safely jumpstart your vehicle. The compact, ergonomically designed clamps are solid copper for maximum conductivity, and there's a built-in ultra-bright dual LED flashlight with seven modes, including an SOS emergency strobe. It's easily rechargeable with a USB outlet, and you can charge your smartphone or tablet while you're on the road. Works on any 12-volt lead-acid battery. The Genius Boost from NOCO is the ultimate emergency tool that's safe and easy to use. Quality design, state-of-the-art technology from NOCO, your battery care source since 1914. Get yours at GeniusChargers.com. Do you love vintage cars? Then go to CarsYeah.com and get a free copy of the fantastic Filler Up book. It's a full-color ebook filled with fuel filler fun with over 60 color photographs of vintage cars, plus inspirational quotes from some of the most famous automotive enthusiasts of all time. Simply go to CarsYad.com and click on the free book button on the homepage. Download your free filler-up book today at Cars Yeah. All right, John, we're back and we're entering the last lap. And this is where I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some really quick blips of the throttle answers. So are you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay, go for it. What is the best automotive advice you've ever received? Ah, sell it. Don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've got to ask where that came from. Well, you know, once a car starts giving you trouble, I had a, a, a wonderful Saab, a 2.2 Aero wagon, and it was it was quick as lightning, but its gearbox started to give troubles. And, and I was looking at it and humming and hawing, and I loved the car because it, it really was so quick. I had had it tweaked. It was, it was chipped, and uh, it was really quick. And, uh, but this guy said to me, my boy, you're just going to throw money at this thing, good money after bad, so get rid of it quick as you can. So, yes, yeah. another sob story, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would yeah. you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your success over the years? Yeah, it's maybe a, a, a hindrance as well in that I can never do anything without giving it 100%. I, I just cannot do something half halfway or, or three-quarters of the way. It's got to be, you know, I, I will spend hours polishing the minutest little speck out of my uh, sculpture before I mail it off. And it, it, I just, I, I cannot do something unless it's perfect, which is a problem. Well, I understand how that can be a problem, but in the world that you live in and what you're creating, I think it's an it's a really great personal habit to have because you are creating works of art, things that are very special that will last way beyond the first owner's lifetime. So uh, I wouldn't dwell too much on that. I think you're going down the right path. Okay. Do you have a resource that you'd like to share with our listeners that you think they would really enjoy? I don't offhand. You know, I, I think a lot of your listeners would be restoration guys, etc. And uh, I think they they would probably know some good resources. I don't actually know any at all other than the paint supplier who I use here for automotive paint is fantastic. He can mix any color, any time, and base coat, clear coat, whatever I need. Well, let's give him a shout out. What is his name? He's Maroons, M-A-R-O-U-N-S, Maroons Paint Suppliers. There you go. Well, if you're in South Africa and you need paint, Maroons is the guy to check out. There they go. Yep. How about a book? Is there one book in particular you think our listeners would really enjoy reading? Well, if any of your listeners have a few free moments and would like a fantastic book of fiction, they've got to read a book called I Am Pilgrim. I Am Pilgrim. It's about a, a secret U.S. agent who is so secret, even the Secret Service didn't know he existed. And he gets involved with a nasty guy called the Saracen who's out to get the U.S. of A. It's a, it's a real gripper. I Am Pilgrim. 
Very cool. Well, we have a section on the Cars yeah! website that's titled Guest Recommended Books. And listeners, you can go there and you can find a link to this book and all the great books that our past guests have recommended here on Cars yeah! as well as all the resources John has shared with us today. So just go to CarsYeah.com and pipe in John Vessels. And John's last name is W-E-S-S-E-L-S, and you'll find his show notes page. Do you have any interesting hobbies outside of your passion for cars, John? I cycle. I I have a road bike, and I do a lot of cycling uh, with a retired judge who's very interesting and fascinating to cycle with. Oh, yeah. So. And the older I get and the longer I ride my bicycle, the more I prefer going uphill than downhill. I like to feel in control as opposed to hurtling downhill. Oh, yes, I see. Well, you sent me a great picture of you on your bike, and you certainly look years younger than your age. And I think that <laughs> that cycling has uh, helped for sure get out there and move around. All right, John, we're up to the checkered flag. And this mm-hmm. last question can be a real doozy. If you could only have one collector car in your garage, but don't worry about the cost because today I'll buy you whatever you'd like, but you can't mm-hmm. sell it to buy a bunch of other cars with, so that little trick's off the table. Mm-hmm. What would that one vehicle be, and more importantly, why? Wow, that's a real doozy because I would go from either a Duesenberg or a Citroen or a Porsche 356, uh-huh. but I think I'd probably have to go for the practical one. I'd probably, I'd probably go for the Citroen. The Citron. Okay. And again, tell us a little bit about the, the year make and model that really tugs on your heartstring and why that Citron is so important to you. Okay. It's the, it's, it, I just find the styling of it so extraordinary and so clever and clean. There's no extraneous, its form follows function absolutely perfectly with its pointy nose and its slightly chopped off back and, and sort of tapered tail. Besides its rather clunky four-cylinder engine. I, I would go for the, the final, the DS20, I think it's a DS21 Palace, which would have the fuel injection. And, and that would really be an interesting car to drive. And, and, and practical as well. Ah, there you go. And you said that was, uh, you saw that car originally in the mid-50s? Was it 56? 56, the, auto, the Paris Auto Show, it, it exploded onto the world and knocked everybody's socks off. It was rather like the 61 show when the Jaguar E-Type arrived. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. That's spectacular. People couldn't believe what they were seeing. Very nice yeah. choice. I love the reasons why as well. Well, John, you have taken me on a great ride today, and I knew you would. I've really enjoyed your stories, and I want to thank you for sharing your journey with me and the Cars Yeah listeners. Could you give us one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset in that Citroen DS? Okay. Whatever you do, Do it to the best of your ability and remember that every second that disappears will never come back. Uh, Oh, so important. And what's the best way for our listeners to learn more about you and this work you're doing? Well, I have a website. It's www.autcouture. That's A-U-T-C-O-U-T-U-R-E.com. And have a look. It's a wonderful website, listeners. I encourage you to go and take a look at what John is creating. It's absolutely beautiful, these works of art. They're just magnificent. And you'll find everything we've shared here again at carsyad.com. Just put John in the search box and his show notes page will pop right up. John, thanks again for being so generous today with your time and your expertise and for sharing your experiences with the listeners. Until we talk again, I'll see you down the road. Cheers, Mark. It was my pleasure and an absolute joy to be chatting with you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah! Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah! Yeah!